Welcome everybody to five really important questions about climate change as depicted in Man Cave, a one man sci-fi climate change tragic comedy. Hey everybody, I'm Tim Mooney, uh, author performer of Man Cave, a one man sci-fi climate change tragic comedy. Man Cave depicts the last man on earth broadcasting to whatever Klingons or Vulcans might still be out there listening. It is essentially a depiction of what some scientists call near-term human extinction, a suggestion that our environment, infrastructure, and ability to survive may collapse in a much more sudden fashion than we have come to expect. Man Cave, which will be available to view this Sunday and Monday, May 3rd and 4th, and again June 28th and 29th, is one of eight one-man plays I'll be presenting over the coming eight weeks. This is the very first in a series of videos that I'll be putting out to introduce the concepts surrounding these plays, answering some of the critical questions that I had to deal with as I put these shows together. First, five really important questions about climate change. Question number one, is this near-term human extinction inevitable? Or put another way, will our technology always outrun our maturity? My answer, yes, but with a caveat. Uh, this is inevitable to the degree that the individuated consciousness feels driven to act in its own best self-interest, often in opposition to the good of the species, often in the opposition to the good of the planet. Yes, we have the freedom and the liberty to act in ways that please and benefit us. However, as someone once said, your right to swing your arms ends at the point where your fist meets my nose. And so, the inevitability of near-term human extinction may be contingent on the degree to which we value freedom and liberty above all else. We find ourselves caught in the classic prisoner's dilemma. You've seen it a million times on TV. Two prisoners being interviewed in separate rooms might both go free, but only as long as each can count on the other to not rat out himself. If I give up my privileges and comforts uh, for the sake of the planet at large, might I not be making a meaningless gesture of a sacrifice in light of the fact that I cannot count on the other 8 billion people on the planet to be making a similar sacrifice? Is our need to make personal gain as compared to or in competition with our neighbor a necessary outgrowth of having an individuated consciousness? Is this conspicuous consumption and display of creature comforts a trap? Will every species throughout the cosmos inevitably fall into this trap? Or, as I say in the play, is this why we don't have any actual ETs? Question two, aren't we, the human race, special? Yes and no. As far as we can tell, no species has developed to the degree that we have. That includes brain power and all the stuff that brain power enables us to do, create tools, develop agriculture, generate technology. That's pretty special. And yet, the extinction of our species would not be the end of the world, at least as far as we know it. Uh, without us, all evidence indicates that the world would gradually restore itself. Some very quickly, like the blue skies that we can now see out there, and uh, others much more slowly, like plastic. Uh, as far as we can tell, plastic may still be around when the next thinking species evolves. That might not be very special to be remembered as the litterbug species. But are we special uh, in terms of the deus ex machina, uh, in which God rushes in at the last second to lift us all to safety? Uh, deus ex machina from the Greek theater uh, literally God from the machine, in which a god uh, supposedly a machine like a crane might drop in at the last second and lift us away to safety, kind of like what we might call the rapture. Well, that's a pretty big gamble. Also under the category of aren't we special, is space travel an effective strategy against near-term human extinction? 
Imagine we could create a Noah's Ark, which might carry 16 people out of our solar system to find eventually another livable planet. Those 16 people would not arrive at the other end, and only their great, 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 etc. grandchildren might survive the trip. Are underground bunkers a solution to near-term human extinction? They would face the same issues of storage, reproduction, population control found on the spaceship, and likely run out of resources and room long before it was safe to emerge into the open air again. A special bunkered family would face all the same issues of competition for space, an even more exaggerated perceived need to win out against other members of the now trapped tribe for survival. Both solutions find us still trapped in the individuated winner-loser consciousness, where a special handful wins out, while eight billion less special individuals die back here in Earth's open air. Question three. Isn't it arrogant to suggest that we tiny, puny humans have an impact on the planet at large? That is to say, isn't that God's territory? First, let's not let this question pass without noting the contradiction. First, we want to be special enough that God would definitely save us. Second, we aren't special enough that we could create so great an impact that we might have to do something about it. Our ego and our position in the great chain of being shifts depending upon what demands it might put on us, which brings up the inevitable question. Are we molding our vision of God into such a shape as may provide us with the most convenient excuse? Would God want us to exploit him or her as an excuse for avoiding responsibility and doing nothing? Yes, but isn't climate change part of an established pattern of warming and cooling cycle that the Earth is continuously and naturally going through? The first extinction that we know of, 439 million years ago. Number two, 364 million years ago. Number three, 251 million years ago. Extinction number four, 200 million years ago. Extinction number five is the one that we're most familiar with. That's the one where the big asteroid kicked up a huge cloud along with some volcanoes and wiped out the dinosaurs. As sudden as that asteroid hit, it was still another thousand to ten thousand years before the extinction resolved itself. That was 65 million years ago. The one we're currently in the middle of, yes, we are now in the middle of an extinction, started about 120 years ago. Since 1900, half of the 177 mammal species has lost more than 80% of its population. We also happen to be a mammal species. Question four, what does the coronavirus teach us about climate change? COVID-19 is certainly alerting us to the precarious position within which our systems operate. It's reminding us of the paradoxical nature of human memory and the need to take history seriously. Our instinct suggests that if something isn't within living memory, it somehow doesn't count. Those former rules no longer apply. The nature of living memory carries with it the ongoing assumption that what has always been will always continue to be. Example, the 1918 flu pandemic, which killed 50 million people, predates about 99.98% of the people on Earth now. Hence, we must have fixed that pandemic problem by now. Ergo, budgeting to cope with a pandemic? A waste of money. Similarly, the United States has been a functioning government for 250 years almost, long before any of us were born. Of course, I assume it will remain so forever. COVID-19 is also demonstrating the nature of two things, the feedback loop and exponential growth.
We all know about the feedback loop when, for instance, you hold a microphone in front of a speaker, the sound going into the microphone is coming out of the speaker at the same time, and suddenly that sound is chasing and overlapping with itself to the point that it is suddenly painful to listen to. The coronavirus has one person infecting two people, who in turn infect four people, before that first person is even diagnosed, hence exponential growth. At the start of the Industrial Revolution two, three centuries ago, the amount of carbon in the air was around 280 parts per million. Now, 415 parts per million. The last time there was this much carbon in the air, there were no humans on Earth. This increase in carbon creates a rise in temperature, the greenhouse effect, which melts the permafrost, stuff that has been frozen for about 10,000 years, that releases gas, that lifts the temperature further, forest fires become more severe, releasing more carbon and eradicating plant life that used to absorb carbon. The feedback loop. And question five. How do I convince my right-wing friend about this? Here's the surprise answer. Your right-wing friend already knows. There was a survey taken in April 2019, just over a year ago. The number has gone up since then. But 69% of Americans were registered as believing in climate change. At the same time, um, those who were surveyed indicated that they supposed about 54% of Americans believed in climate change, a difference of 15%. And as we know, 97 and 98% of climate scientists believe in climate change. Those 30% of the population who continue to disagree largely do not express their disagreement in light of scientific rationale. They may allude to science as they suggest these things are cyclical. The Earth heats up and cools off on a regular basis. They generally don't mention that the Earth does this over a period of traditionally 50 to 100 million years. If they cite evidence, it's usually anecdotal. It snowed yesterday. I would suggest that a majority of this 30% come from some category of those who don't want to look uncool or like a lib or a sucker or to be in the minority. People with a social motivation and rationale. Because here's an argument that I've found that works. I think you're kidding yourself. Not you're stupid or you're ignorant, but you're kidding yourself. That assumes, hey, you know better than that. It also says that the opinion that you express is outside the social norm of the world as I know it. It says, I'm cool enough to stand outside your perceived world of what you need to say to look cool and express something else, maybe with some implied judgment. If the other's opinion was the result of a social need, then that's an argument that may well work. So those are my five extremely important questions about climate change. I wonder if they overlap with yours. Please leave comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you want to see a fun, dramatic take on this topic, please tune in to our Facebook page on Sunday, May 3rd, or to our Zoom performance on Monday, May 4th, both shows at 9 p.m., or uh, check us out on Sunday, Monday, June 28th, 29th, also at 9 p.m. For those Monday shows, tickets are $5 and can be purchased through calendly.com slash Tim Mooney Rep. The show is also available to come to your school or to your community group once we get back on the road this fall. We also have a Patreon campaign. We are a not-for-profit educational institution dedicated to inspire, inform, enlighten, educate, and entertain. If you see the value of that vision, please consider a donation and or join us on patreon.com slash Tim Mooney Rep. Man Cave is also available as a book, adult and young adult versions. And for more on all of this, please visit us at timmooneyrep.com. Thanks very much. See you soon.